Hi so, everybody, um, uh, my name is um, Suresh Venivas. I have been working on XTFS for uh, more than three years now. I used to work at, uh, at Yahoo uh, on XTFS and at uh, Yahoo we essentially worked on more stability related features, scalability of XTFS and some of the new features we have added in terms of you know, quota, federation, things like that. I moved over to Hardenworks. I'm one of the co-founders at uh, Hardenworks. I'm also um, a computer and a PMC member for uh, Peru. So, um, in the today's topic, uh, what I'll do is uh, I'll uh, uh, cover the background of uh, STFS availability, uh, how it does uh, provide fault tolerance, and what are all the issues that exist and, and how we are solving that. Uh, mainly, you know, name node being single point of failure, and high availability, uh, the use cases related to that, and uh, the design of uh, the solution. Uh, I'll also go over, for folks who want to try it out, uh, I'll go over what is currently available and what is still under development. And we'll also cover some future work and I'll have lot, lots of questions related, you know, a time for question and answer. Uh, you can ask me uh, questions related to HDFS in general, uh, it need not be specific to this topic. Um, so one of the key things with uh, HDFS is early on when uh, at Yahoo we were trying to solve the problem related to big data. Uh, uh, of course, as you guys know, HDFS is influenced by GFS. Uh, some of the key uh, decisions that GFS uh, took, uh, we carried for that forward in HDFS. Uh, we also made our own uh, simplifying design decisions and that really helped us in getting HDFS to become stable, uh, to scale, and easily make it production ready. So we did that uh, in a year or so, and I think Arun is going to touch upon some of that history aspect. Uh, some of the key uh, simplifying decisions that uh, we did for HDFS was not to uh, write our own storage layer for use, you know, using the raw block device. Instead, we decided that we will rely on the uh, on the local file systems such as ext3, xfs, uh, ext4. This was a key decision because we did not have to spend a lot of time stabilizing and dealing with the data corruption issues uh, related to you know, storing data on raw block device. Uh, instead, we could rely upon the, uh, the stability of the file systems themselves such as ext3, ext4. The other uh, uh, key thing with HDFS, and this is true with GFS also, uh, People miss this when they look at the architecture of GFS or HDFS. Uh, the, the key thing is, earlier the systems were designed with RAID for, uh, for uh, you know, sort of fault tolerance, right? So if this fail, you choose an appropriate uh, RAID, and then what you do is, uh, if a disk fails, then you immediately act and you know, you add another disk and you rebuild the RAID. Uh, array. But here, the choice was uh, different. They decided to go with uh, uh, multiple replicas. Right? So the advantage with uh, multiple rep multiple replicas is, uh, if a system, you know, the, the whole design is based on you know, nodes fail, this fail, right, and racks can go away, right, in a cluster. And when when you take that into your design consideration, uh, having multiple replicas helped us uh, in the sense that you know, if a node goes away. Uh, there is an active monitoring uh, component in HDFS which looks at replicas that have gone away and replicates it, right? Versus uh, having to, you know, run and, you know, put another disk into the RAID, right? And rebuild the RAID. Uh, the other uh, thing is also typically HDFS is configured uh, uh, with, you know, maybe 10% excess capacity so that over a you know, period of many months you accumulate these kind of failures and then go address them, right? Uh, versus in case of RAID, you know, you have two disk failures, you might lose data, things like that, right? Uh, so that was another key decision. The other thing that, uh, you know, sometimes uh, uh, in HDFS, uh, you know, a lot of people comment about is there is a single name node, there is just a, you know, single master. But uh, it was a key decision for making HDFS, you know, quickly develop it and make it production ready. Uh, and, and, and 
what we ended up doing was just like GFS, we have single name node master, and uh, that master holds all its data in memory. Right? So you, you know, don't hit the disk at all, and you can be more performant. And and what we ended up doing is vertically scale the name node uh, for larger cluster uh, uh, sizes. So for example. Uh, I think the biggest uh, cluster that I know of is at Facebook with uh, roughly 200 petabytes of data. Uh, we also have uh, lots of clusters at uh, Yahoo, uh, more than you know, 30, 40 petabytes of data. Right? So, so uh, that was, uh, you know, that was a key decision to uh, get the HDFS ready quickly. And the other thing is uh, to tie it back to our availability. Keeping things simple also makes it really robust. Right? If we had built it uh, really uh, as a you know, complicated software, we would have had failures that we had to deal with, and we could not go to production with those kind of failures. So, so the simplicity also was key in making it robust. Now, so with all these decisions made, how well you know it all worked? Uh, one of the studies that we did at uh, Yahoo, we saw. Um, Roughly 19 blocks lost out of 329 million blocks, um, you know, or, or 20,000 nodes uh, in 10 different clusters. Right. So, and that was uh, done in 2009, where uh, HDFS was still in its uh, infancy. And uh, if you look at this, uh, 19 blocks lost, uh, you know, out of 329 million blocks, it's seven nights of reliability. Of course, right? For a file system. You never want to lose any data, and we did have some bugs that uh, we have fixed in uh, release 20 and 21 uh, to address uh, uh, those you know, uh, 19 blocks that, that we lost. The other uh, uh, key thing, which is relevant to the topic I'm covering, is how stable is name node? Right? Why did we not do uh, name node high availability earlier? Okay. Why have we waited this long? One of the reasons uh, is in a, in, a, in a study that we did, which covered 18 months uh, period, we saw 22 failures in 25 different HDFS clusters. Right? So that's you know 0.58 failures per cluster per year. Right? And that's, a, that's, that's not very significant, especially for uh, Yahoo uh, use case, which is batch processing. Um, and out of those 22 failures, only eight could have uh, benefited uh, from having a name node HA. Right? Uh, the rest of the failures were uh, things that would have gotten triggered even if we had failed over to the other node. Uh, so given this, we uh, considered um, HA as a lower priority. Right? However, now the things are changing in Hadoop ecosystem. Right? There are uh, solutions that are built around Hadoop which have uh, you know, real-time requirements. Right? Uh, in such a case, a name node failure would uh, would would affect the uh, production, whatever serving the data, things like that, right? In real time, and and also Hadoop is now graduating from you know web companies uh, to now it is going to enterprise enterprises, right? And high availability is one of the key features for enterprises. So let me. Uh, um, let me cover some of the related work and the relevance of this for this talk is uh, there were some attempts made for doing high availability for name node and uh, from out of these activities we have learned quite a bit and we have applied that into the current solution that we are building. Uh, the earliest uh, uh, work was backup name node that was done in release 21. Uh, so if uh, uh, you guys have, you know, run HDFS cluster, you know that there is active name node and there is a secondary name node. And the idea of secondary name node is uh, active name node cannot do checkpointing and so secondary name node is a checkpointer. The backup name node was an earlier implementation of a component that we intended to use as standby in the future. And so what it does is the edits, uh, edit log or uh, the journaling that name node does of changes that's happening on the file system that gets streamed to another node 
in real time instead of uh, the secondary name node where it just you know picks up the files and does the checkpointing. Here it is in real time getting streamed to the backup node, uh, and and backup node is always in sync with the active node, right? So you could choose to use the backup node for some kind of read loads, right? If you if you want to. Uh, so that was uh, uh, you know the early work, and we are planning to use some of the components we added here. Uh, in the final edge solution. There is also Avatar name node that was done in uh, Facebook. Uh, so the main use case here was the main reason for unavailability in HDFS is upgrades, things like that, maintenance. And uh, uh, in Facebook, they wanted to have a standby where they you know manually fail over during upgrades and stuff like that so that their service is not affected. So there are some uh, uh, learnings that we have had from that that is, uh, that is applied to the solution we are currently building. There is also a prototype that we had built uh, long back uh, using Linux HA and some of those uh, things uh, we incorporate as well in terms of designing the interfaces for HA. Uh, there is also a prototype that is done in eBay which uses some custom components um, and so these are all the um, these are all the solutions that we have looked at and uh, and that has influenced our current design. So let me quickly go over uh, the terminology. The, uh, the active name node in the solution is the name node that uh, uh, that you know provides read and write access to the clients. It's also the name node that perform, you know that sends commands to the data nodes to you know delete a block and things like that. Only active name node does that. The standby name node is a name node that is waiting to become active, right? It's uh, standby. And uh, um, <clears throat> currently, we don't use standby to, uh, uh, you know, perform, you know, to, to uh, uh, provide, you know, read operations uh, to the clients. In the future, we could allow read operations uh, for the clients at the standby and thus scaling, you know, the total read. Uh, also. Uh, there are different kinds of standbys. Uh, the current HA, uh, if you look at uh, release 20 and if you, you know, call it HA, uh, what we have is a cold standby. What name node promises is it persists its state without, you know, corruption, right? It ensures that the state uh, is persisted in a, in a secondary storage. Now you could choose to bring up another name node using this state persisted in secondary storage, right? So essentially you have a cold standby solution. You could have another machine that you bring it up as a, a name node using the state persisted. Uh, and that's the solution that we have right now. You could also foresee having a warm standby where uh, in case of cold standby, it has no state from the active name node at all, right? It's got zero state. It's got to load the entire thing. Warm could be, you know, it has uh, the file system metadata it has loaded up and it's slowly keeping pace with the active, right? It doesn't have all the active state, but it has, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, uh, state uh, that active has. And in this case, compared to cold uh, standby, the failover is much faster, right? Warm could become an active, an active name node much more quickly. And then finally, the hard standby, which is what we are building in, uh, uh, in, in the current HS solution where standby keeps pay, you know, pace with uh, the active and keeps track of all the state changes and it can quickly become active right, during a failover. So let's look at uh, some of the high level uh, use cases for, uh, uh, for, um, uh, for name node high availability. So in, in one of the slides I covered that you know, HDFS is really robust and fault tolerant right, to replication and stuff like that. The current problem is name node, is, there is a single name node and if a name node fails, HDFS entire cluster is not useful, right? So uh, one of the reasons why a name node would be down is planned downtime and this is the main cause of uh, service unavailability. This is a case where you make a configuration change and you have to restart the name node. Uh, you make a, you know, you want to upgrade and this is this downtime is longer in case of larger clusters, right? So for smaller clusters, you can restart the name node in under one or two, three minutes, right? But in case of large clusters uh, at Yahoo, it would take 30 minutes to restart a name node, right? So your unavailability time is 30 minutes if you're, you know, in case of planned downtime. Uh, so, and this is one of the reasons why outer name node came into existence and, 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 and the reason why name node HA is also critical. 
The other kind of uh, uh, use case is unplanned downtime, where we have had cases where we have been running clusters and uh, and the memory would go bad, or you know, disk fail, um, or some other hardware uh, error results in you having to switch uh, from one name node, uh, you know, node to another node. Um, there are cases where server becomes unresponsive. There are also software failures where you know name node process itself might fail, uh, or JVM related issues. These are uh, uh, kind of you know downtimes that are very infrequent uh, based on our observation uh, at Yahoo. Uh, so now, even these high-level use cases, what are we going to support? Uh, what kind of failures are we planning to support in the first cut? We uh, typically in HA uh, double failures are not supported. That is, we have one active, one standby. If both of them fail. You know, you don't have a service, but we plan to support a single hardware failure. That is, if one active name node dies, the other guy, you know, uh, picks up the active role and then continues to provide the service. In, uh, and in case of uh, software failure, some software software failures can be handled, but some software failures that occur both on the active and the standby, you know, you, you know, if you fail over, it happens on the new active, and those kind of software failures cannot be handled as well. Um, let's look at some of the deployment models. Today we have a solution HFS is deployed with single name node and a secondary name node. We want to continue to support that. So you can deploy HTFS with high availability feature uh, uh, you know, becoming available in trunk and uh, 2.0. You can still run your previous configuration. It's backward compatible. Right? You don't have to make any change. You can also run a single name node configuration if you are doing proof of concept uh, or you are doing some kind of testing and things like that. So there is no the, having to use the HA configuration is not mandatory. Uh, and um, also, uh, we will support uh, uh, two kinds of HA deployments: uh, deployments where administrator wants to do manual failover and doesn't want uh, automatic failover. Right? So there are some. Uh, administrators who want to be in control of the failover and things like that. So that mode will support. Uh, in this mode, again, right, the main cause of downtime uh, is handled because you know during upgrade, administrator is involved and then you can continue the service uh, uh, without you know he can keep the service going. The other mode is active standby with automatic failover, and that's what we are currently working on. <coughs> Uh, you have a hot standby and then the system automatically fails over, it detects the problem with active and then fails over. So let's look at uh, the, uh, the high level design. The key thing uh, in case of HA is uh, there are two uh, key information uh, in the name node. The first one is the namespace, that is the file system namespace. And the second is the location of blocks. So this information, in order to have a warm or a hard standby, you need standby to have the same state as the active name node. For namespace, what we do is, uh, when the standby starts up, it loads the uh, file system state that the active has loaded, the same file system state. And then it keeps up with the active name node through the edit log journaling that the name node does. For every change that uh, that is happening in the file system, that change is sent over to the standby and standby is applying it to its own uh, namespace, right? That is in memory, and that's how it keeps uh, its namespace uh, hot. And in case of uh, um, block locations, what we do is uh, the data nodes that are there should currently register with one name node, and they send block report saying I have all these blocks. They also periodically send I received this block, so that name node now knows that this block is at this data node. Um, that communication now happens with both active and standby. So the data nodes register with both the active and the standby and they send uh, block reports and block receive and all the other communication that happens that establishes the location of block at the name node. The failover controller uh, is a daemon that we decided to keep it outside the name node. What it does is it, uh, you know, just, just like it, you know, it, it is done in many of the other HA frameworks, this is a daemon that monitors the name node process and any other required required resources that uh, that uh, you know name node requires for it to be active. And then what it does is it can you know choose active standby and then perform failover things like that. So that's one of the other big components in this design. 
with the uh, act day one standby comes um, you know the problem of fencing right you have uh, you have edit logs that you don't want during you know there's a condition called split brain where two name nodes if they cannot communicate with each other they might end up thinking thinking that they are both active right and then they might try to perform the activity that only an active should perform, such as you know, writing to an edit log. You don't want two guys to be writing to an edit log and corrupt the edit log, right? Also, uh, a name node code send deletion, block deletion to a data node, and two of them are sending block deletions to different data nodes, resulting in removing all the replicas of a block. Those kinds of problems happen. So uh, there is some level of fencing and uh, also um, stone it, things like that, to ensure that there's only one active in the cluster. The other component is client failover. Now that you have two name nodes, and any one of them could be active at any point in time, a client should be able to talk to, figure out who is active, and only talk to the active uh, to get its HDFS service. So that client side uh, 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 failover, um, and there's also another alternative which is you have a virtual IP and then IP fails over between the active, active to standby uh, during failover. So that is uh, the other component of the design. And some of this design um, is uh, written, is available in HDFS 1623. I have a few slides around, you know, where to get the information. Uh, where we added, you know, we, we posted this design where uh, keeping a lot of things open so that people can tweak it and, and, and uh, you know, customize it in such a way that it is uh, applicable to their deployment and their environment. Right? So let's look at the failover controller itself. It's a separate daemon from the name node. The reason why it is uh, outside name node as a separate process is this is a simple process. It's very easy to you know get this uh, because of its simplicity. It could be a lot more robust than a name node, which has you know which runs on a much larger JVM and things like that. Also. Um, if name node goes into GC pause and things like that, those things should not be a, affecting failover controller because it is the one that is making the key decisions in the HA cluster. Right? So what uh, this uh, failover controller does is it looks at, um, so we, we follow the same things that uh, some of the HA frameworks do, where uh, in case of HA frameworks, uh, there are demons like this, which, mod, which uh, you know, monitor uh, resources, and for example, you could say if the name node has lost its IP connectivity, this guy cannot be active anymore. So I design, right? Or the other guy could say he has lost his network connectivity, I have to become active, right? So, so these failover controllers have uh, uh, do model things uh, as resources. So one of the resources is name node. What it does is it periodically um, runs a name node command and makes sure that name node is active and name node is responding in a timely manner. Otherwise, it says this name node is not healthy and then it fails over. Right? So that's one of the functionalities of uh, failover controller. And failover controller also um, uses Zookeeper and yeah, you are addressing this big thing. But what happens if, say, the standby is partitioned from a set of data nodes, mm -hmm. right? And it does not receive block reports, right? So, and then when it comes back uh, in contact with the data nodes, so is there uh, any consistency? So, so, so um, here are uh, a couple of things. What we do is, for us, there are. Uh, um, I have a slide around that, but given that you asked the question, there are two kinds of shared resources for us, right? One is the location where we are writing edit log. The other is data nodes themselves are shared resources for two, two name nodes, right? Uh, what we do is we have uh, some kind of a fencing mechanism at the data node, where um, data nodes constantly, if they're communicating with two name nodes, they know that who is the latest name node, right? Through some kind of transaction ID mechanism. And it ensures that it accepts only commands from the active name node. It, it has an arbitration built in where it says if, if there is a condition where in split frame, if two guys are active, it ensures that only one guy can be really active, truly active. The other guy is in a faulty condition. So it can detect that and it doesn't accept any commands from the old active that you know, is no longer actually uh, active in the HA cluster. Yeah, uh, one name node is called now. We have state standby name node that comes up. During which time, this goes down at a later point of time. 
the node comes back online. So you have this tail configuration. We can we can uh, talk about this. I think uh, these things are uh, uh, handled in the design, but uh, you know, I think this probably is a longer discussion. So that's, that's how does the system adapt to Hadoop 23, which itself changes the notion of name node? So, uh, because of federation? Yeah. So, uh, what we do is, uh, in case of uh, HA, HA is done for the name node, right? And federation brings multiple name nodes. So, for each name node, you will have a standby. So, that, that's the only change. So, federation and HA name node, they are sort of our problem. Only touch point is, in case of federation, the same set of data nodes are used by multiple name nodes, right? And hence, unlike the previous version where there was a single name node, and if that name node is down, your entire cluster is not being utilized. Versus in case of federation, if one name node is down, that part of the namespace is down, that's it. The rest of the name nodes are still available and you still can continue to use the cluster, right? The entire cluster is not down. But, but would the system be redundant given that federation itself would give you high availability? For federation is not high availability. Federation is uh, multiple name nodes, it is scalability and it is multiple name nodes using the same underlying infrastructure. Right? And hence one name node going away doesn't make all this infrastructure useless. Right? Or, or, you know. uh, and so we have added some you know, fencing during split brain and that fencing is done by uh, the, the failover control. So this is how, you know, uh, to recap what we have discussed, uh, there is an active name node and there is a standby name node and the active name node and the standby name node, they share two states. One is the namespace and today the namespace uh, is loaded by the standby and standby keeps up with the active name node uh, through a shared place where journaling is being done. Right? That is the current state of affairs. Uh, and so, active name node as new files are added, deleted, it writes it to the edit log and then it is read by the other standby name node and then it applies it so into its own in-memory state. That's keeping up with uh, uh, the, the active name node. And then the data nodes register with both active and standby and they send block reports and other messages so that you also have block location at both the places. The failover controller is the one that chooses an active when the cluster is brought up. It also monitors a uh, name node and if there is a failure, uh, if the name node is not responding, it is the one that uh, triggers a failover. Right? And that is done by, you know, how does a, a failover controller decide to make a name node active? It is done by leader election using Zookeeper. So a failover controller gets elected as a leader. There can only be one leader in the entire cluster. And that failover control, controller currently makes the local name node. So that's that's the overall picture of uh, the design. So now let's uh, look at what work has gotten completed in uh, uh, in uh, name node high availability, and what you can use currently in uh, release 2.0 and from. Okay, so in case you want to play around with it. Uh, we have completed, uh, uh, you know, we, we have added the notion of active and standby states to the name node. Um, and the current solution user has support for one active name node and a single standby name node. We don't have support for multiple standby name nodes. Uh, standby name node, we modified it to perform checkpointing so that you don't need to have an active standby and a checkpointer or a secondary name node. Right? So the standby does the checkpointing, uh, which used to be done by the secondary name node. Um, current solution uses a shared storage, NFS storage, where the active is writing to the NFS storage and the standby is reading from that NFS storage. Uh, this is how the sharing of the state namespace modification is happening. Um, given that they have a shared storage, we also need fencing, so uh, we have, and, and, and data nodes are also shared resources, so we have fencing of data nodes. And we have uh, Stonet, which is based on a uh, plugin model. So you can keep uh, giving different kinds of scripts, including a power network connected power switch. And what the uh, failover controller, uh, what, you know, there is a tool available which could be executed to Stonet the other way, right, if you want to make uh, a name node active. And then we also have uh, support for client side failover currently, which is based on configuration. So instead of using a specific name node post, use a logical URL to access HDFS. 
and then that logical URL is mapped to two name nodes, right? Two name node posts, and then the client side determines who is the active and then connects to the active. And if the active fails, it fails over to the other name node. That's how the client side failover works. So what is uh, pending and what is uh, still under development? <coughs> Current solution, uh, as I said, is only manual failover and the operator is the one that is failing over the name node, right? choosing one of the name nodes to be active. Now we are adding support for automatic failover. Uh, this is going back to the picture, you have failover controller working with Zookeeper and it chooses an active name node and it performs failover if, if, if the name node becomes uh, unhealthy. The other thing that uh, we are doing is, one of the feedback we have been receiving is, we have built a solution now, it depends on NFS for shared storage and that shared storage itself it becomes a single point of failure. If that shared storage is not available, the standby cannot even keep up. So current solution, what it does is, in the, in the interim solution we have, if the shared storage dies, you know, the active name node shuts down. Essentially, you have moved your single point of failure from name node to a, a shared storage, right? Um, to avoid that, we are now adding some uh, uh, capabilities where we would like to run some daemons. And there is a protocol that was introduced for backup node where you can, a name node can stream edits to uh, uh, to another server. And so we'll have multiple of those daemons running. And then so the name node will be streaming multiple edit log streams to these different daemons. And you know, uh, you keep multiple copies for reliability, right? And you eliminate the need for NFS. Instead, it becomes a, an internal HDFS component. Right? So there's no external dependency anymore. And because we run multiple of them, there is no single point. Uh, there is some uh, extra work needed for management and monitoring. Given that you have active and standby, uh, you need complete state of uh, what, what, how the HA cluster is performing. Uh, there is also some uh, more uh, need for uh, tests which uh, do fault injection. Uh, some of these HA kind of uh, solutions, they are very hard to test. The only way to test them is create boundary conditions through fault injection. So there, there is need for you know, fault injection uh, tests and also a lot more testing. So now the plan for uh, HA is it will be available in one of the 2.x uh, releases uh, along with other some of the other exciting key features that are coming out uh, such as wire compatibility and uh, web HDFS, things like that. So, what are the things uh, uh, that we might do in future related to high availability? Uh, today we support single active and a single standby. Some uh, deployments uh, may want to use multiple standby. That way, if you bring down a standby from maintenance, you have another standby to take over. Right? Uh, and hence, you you know handle multiple failures. The other thing that we are exploring is currently the failover is all built based on the inter on the client side, right? Where client side is the one that is failing over. We want to do it using virtual IP where an, uh, an IP fails over along with the active uh, name node, so that you know you just connect to one IP address and that's where the active is running. Uh, it also has the advantage of uh, not only just simplifying the failover, it simplifies it with protocols such as HTTP. Right? So you just go to a URL and you don't need to do client side intelligence for uh, I need to connect here or there or you know, build proxy front end, things like that. Um, some of the detailed design of uh, this feature is in uh, six, HTML 1623. Uh, what we did is we developed uh, Till manual failover, we developed uh, this in a separate branch, and then we merged it when the manual failover was uh, completed. But still, you know, automatic failover and some of this general demon, that work is still going on. And to track that work that is happening, we have an umbrella Jira HDFS three to seven eight. Please take a look at it uh, to see the progress of what is you know to understand what is pending and the progress on the spending work issues. So any other? Questions related to HA, HDFS, so you will have a <coughs> so you will have a two demons running for this HA or for a single demon. Uh, so uh, the way it would be is on a name node, right? So there is a there is a node on which you want to run the name node process, right? So there is a name node process. 
So there are two such nodes, each are running a name node process and a failover controller. Right. So there is a failover controller, there is a name, name node process on a node, and then it is also you know, on the standby you have a failover controller and a name node process. One name node process is in active state, the other one is in standby state. <laughs> So the question is not regarding to this, but it's about HDFS. So in the first, uh, what was the bottleneck as to why HDFS was not able to overwrite things? You cannot overwrite a file in HDFS. So what was the bottleneck behind So, it? so random writes is uh, lot harder when you have uh, uh, a pipeline, okay? Because pipeline does result in very strange uh, boundary conditions. So, uh, if you want to appreciate. Uh, the complexity involved in the pipeline, you should look at the new append design, which talks about, you know, when you're writing in a pipeline, how the acknowledgements need, needs to flow through, right? Uh, how the generation stamp needs to be updated, things like that. So, append itself added a lot more complexity. And in case of append, uh, interestingly, what happens is, if in the pipeline, one of the data nodes fell off from the pipeline, you at least have the length which is changing, which is different, right, between the data nodes that were there and the data node that fell off. Uh, also, the generation stamp is updated. Uh, but the key thing is there is also uh, this length, right, that will be a mismatch. In case of random writes, when you overwrite parts, you don't even have length that is changing. So there are some interesting issues when you do random writes in a pipeline. So, uh, and, and, and hence, you know, you must have seen some uh, discussion around should we turn off append because it adds a lot more complexity. Uh, I would I would think, you know, random writes is at least two times more complex than append. Even append was introduced just now, so what was the bottleneck that was preventing append? So append was introduced in release 19, okay, just to give you an append, the background on append. And it was done for HBase. What HBase does is it writes its own journal, right, to onto uh, HDFS. And the only way you can ensure that the data is uh, made durable on HDFS is by closing the file. So the only way it would work before this append and uh, and flush uh, was you open, write some things, and you close, and you start creating lots and lots of files. So in release 19. The main requirement for uh, for uh, for HBase was uh, this flush, right? An ability to say I have flushed the data onto HDFS. Now it's no longer in my process, right? In my memory space, it's gone to HDFS, and HDFS needs to make it durable. Along with that, we also added append. Currently, append feature is not used uh, as far as I know by any application, including HBase. So in release 19, a first cut append was done, and initially some uh, failure scenarios and boundary conditions were not thought through. That resulted in data corruption. And so what we did is we turned off append and then append work happened in a separate branch. And it's come, you know, it's become really stable now. Though it is called append feature, it's actually hflush. That is what uh, uh, HBase uses. And then this feature was rewritten in release 21, uh, considering all the failures uh, that we had observed. And so the interesting thing was in release 19, append was done. Meanwhile, release 21 re-implemented append, and some of that design, you know, went back into release 20 as you know we fix more bugs in release 20. Yeah, you mentioned that uh, the standby name node, right, is doing the job of checkpointing with secondary was doing. Um, now, the, the secondary uh, name node concept, uh, that that daemon once upon a time, all it did was just checkpointing, nothing else. So now the second, uh, the standby is doing uh, handling lock reports as well as uh, checkpointing. So have you seen any performance implications? Does it uh, has it on both these Okay. So the the question is uh, now the standby is also doing you know both checkpointing and the duty of a standby that is to keep up with uh, the active name node and the lock reports and things like that. Uh, and the question is, have you seen any performance implications because of this? So, um, when you are doing checkpointing, essentially what you are doing on the standby is uh, you have uh, accumulated edit logs to a certain finalized point. Right? Um, and at that point, you need to just write what is there in your memory onto the disk. Typically on the largest clusters, I have seen uh, FS image of size 10 GB or something like that. And it doesn't take a lot of time to uh, write that. 
Also, when you're writing that, you have stopped being in sync with the active under block reports. But then it's very easy to really catch up with these things because we are not providing any uh, right operations at all on the standby. And currently, we are not also not providing any read operations out of standby. In the future, we might give read operations out of standby just to scale the read. But I don't think it should be a problem. The only complexity is when you are doing checkpointing, suddenly if the active fails and you have to take over the duty of active, you have to abandon checkpointing, which is not a big deal, but you abandon checkpointing and become active. Any other questions? Uh, the daemon which you are writing, uh, how similar or different is it from popular daemons like Keep Alive or Linux H A? So, uh, I mentioned Linux H A uh, some, some time back in one of the slides. Um, this daemon, we, we did consider running Linux H A, you, you know, using Linux H A as a proof of concept uh, earlier. If you look at uh, how we did the development, first we did a protocol to the name node where uh, Typically, this HA framework, what they do is they have a model called resource. And this resource, this uh, HA frameworks, they have commands such as start, stop, monitor, right? And then become active, become standby. These are typically five or six commands they need. And it's a nice way to model uh, a resource, right? And, and enable HA for that. And so we built similar commands for name node also. And so nothing should prevent us from using Linux HA. And then you know, you know, do this uh, where you know Linux HA framework itself is doing, you know, using the same interface and and providing the high availability. The problems that I have seen with that are Linux HA in case of Red Hat Linux is not free. Okay, so that's uh, one of the problems. Second thing is is an issue of this is an external component that is coming in. Okay, the packaging, installation, management, all those things will be different, right? So if now, if, if, if you look at just failover controller itself, okay, it's not, you know, really a rocket science. It's not a complicated piece of code. The other thing also with Linux HA is there are policy engines. You can, you know, configure various things where you say, uh, I want uh, this, you know, weightage for this name node to become active and fail back. And there are a whole bunch of uh, rules and stuff like that. We want to, we don't want to have that level of sophistication to start with. So we want all native, you know, components right now. I think there are a whole bunch of uh, websites that compare, uh, uh, you know, file systems that compare themselves with HDFS. I'm sure you know you can find something. Do you have any comments with respect to that? What was there on the just panel file? I mean, if you have a specific question, you know, I can address that. Because I see a lot of those functionalities that are available in them. They perform to whatever the, the level they perform. So, what is that that that's getting addressed here differently is what I mean. Okay, I, I, I think the architectures are completely different. All we are doing here is um, most of the components in HDFS are designed where they are going to fail and the failure will be handled right, by, by HDFS, except for the name node. So all we are doing here is just doing, you know, building a high availability solution that's all for the name node. And it may not apply to GPFS where it might not have a single master, right? Uh, so in our case, it's a single master, and the master is not highly available. That's what we are trying to do. So Mapper also provides a distributed name right? So how does that different? So what they, I, I don't know enough about the architecture because it's you know I cannot read as you know well about uh, it as HDFS, right? Our code is out there. Anything I can look into it. From what I know, I think they have uh, uh, they run. Um, you know, uh, distrib it's not truly really distributed. These are all, you know, different volumes, right? Volumes are all, you know, chunks, and then uh, each chunk is managed by name node. And, and the understanding I have is you have uh, uh, the file system namespace along with its data all in, you know, three or four nodes, right? Uh, that manage the chunks of those those kind of things. And if you look at it, what it does is, uh, from from what I understand, there's a component called CLDB, and what it does is, that's the one that pieces all these things together. So you go to CLDB and say, where is this uh, 
volume management, you go to that place and then start reading it. If you do that comparison, uh, Federation has something called a client side <coughs> mount table. Okay? Instead of CLDB, all this uh, uh, directory information is there in one configuration. Right? A client can just load it and it knows where, where to go. It's transparently done. Now, if you take Federation and make every node a name node, right, along with its own data node, I think that's sort of what, what they are doing. But I don't know very well about their architecture. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks for listening to me.